Hey everybody, it's The Trout, and coming up on this new episode of The Trout Show is this. And then he comes up, and he stands in front of the microphone, and he throws up. <laughs> all, over, all over the monitor, all over the floor, and then he kind of just wobbles around and he falls over. And he's, he's not passed out, he's just kind of laying there, right? <laughs> laying there in the puke, and I thought, hey... <laughs> You know, I'll start singing the song. That was Rocky Lynn, a great musician, storyteller, and a life that you would not believe. He started out as an orphan, and when he got old enough, he joined the 82nd Airborne. Then he did that for a while. Then he became an artist, and he played for some of the greatest country artists out there. And now he's a successful artist. He's been for many years. Wonderful studio that he was in when I was talking to him. And oh, and by the way, did I tell you that he has his own nonprofit that he's helped along with his partner and all the volunteers to put over 125 kids of Gold Star families through college? And if that's not enough for you, well, there's more stories just like the one you just got through Harry. So if you want to know more about Rocky Lynn and his story and his musical journey, you want to stick around and listen and watch this episode of the Trout Show, which is coming up next. You also are a vet yourself. I am, yes, sir. And and I was reading a little bit about you, but um, when how old were you when you joined the army? Well, when I say that I moved here to care for my dad, he's actually my adoptive dad. Right. Uh, I, I, I grew up at a place called the Barium Springs Home for Children, which is an orphanage in Troutman, North Carolina. Wow. And, and my, my last name. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How weird, right? I said, this guy's famous around here. He should I got, come yeah, here. I got a know? name. Yeah. Actually, you've heard you of the run town. this place. Yeah, I'm from yeah. this place. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I grew up here. My dad, who I, I love with all my soul, he and my mom adopted me when I was five. My dad had a sixth grade education. He, he's not a unintelligent man he's actually very very smart but he grew up during the depression with 10 brothers and sisters yeah and right before he started the sixth grade his his father was hit by a car and paralyzed from the waist down he was an alcoholic and uh, my dad quit and went to work at a at a sawmill and uh raised his family they kind of looked at him he's he's actually one of the there's only one other sister left but he raised them all kind of like their father and uh so we we were economically challenged uh, mm -hmm. growing up. And so for me, the, the best option was the army is, I mean, I, and I look back at it now because of my charity and how much my service meant to me as, as one of the greatest things I've ever been involved with. But at the time I joined the army because I wanted to go to this guitar school in California called GIT. It was like back in the I, day. I remember, like, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. I wanted to go there so bad. It was my, it was my only, it was my biggest dream ever. And the army would pay for that if I did. So I joined the army, but the army get, ended up giving me so much more than I was uh, able to give the army. I mean, I, it was the first time that a that a man ever really said to me, "Son, you can do this." I remember when I graduated jump school, getting the pins they they slammed the pins into your chest, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember that sergeant saying, uh, "Son, if you can do this, you can do anything." And so I. I just believed him, Rick, and I thought, man, I, I, I'm going to try to do it anyway, you know, and so I, here I am still trying it all these years later, thanks to the people in the Army that pointed me in the right direction. Did you want to be a paratrooper? Is that something you wanted, or they said you might be good for that, or how did that all come about? No, uh, I, I didn't really know what it was, to be honest. Uh, they have, when you first when you first start getting involved in the military, the first thing, they you run across a bunch of acronyms. The first one is called it's government. The, yes, it's government. Yeah, yeah. called uh, the ASFAB, the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. And uh, I, I cut school one day because I grew up a little unsupervised. Dad was busy. You know, he worked in a factory and worked hard. And uh, I went to Hickory and took the ASFAB. And uh, I must have got confused. Like, you know, back in the old number two pencil days, you'd fill out the block. And I think I filled out the first block where the second block was or something, because as you get to know me, you'll know it's not possible, but somehow I scored a hundred on the ASFAB, <laughs> uh, which meant I could have done anything. I could have been in the radio yeah. radi radiation department at the hospital, yeah. or maybe learned how to drive a truck or fix something. I could have done anything, 
But since I'd scored 100, my recruiter, his name was Staff Sergeant Dwayne Say, he <laughs> said, uh, you ought to be in the infantry. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I ended up in the infantry. And if you were in the infantry, you could take airborne and be uh-huh. stationed at Fort Bragg, which is near where I lived. Yes. And it paid an extra $129 a month. That's why I did it. Yeah. Uh, and I had actually never been in an airplane before I jumped out of the first airplane that I was in. And uh, I, I don't know that it really sunk in till we were in that plane that we were going to leave that plane while it was still in the air. <laughs> uh, but I'm grateful that I did it and I'm proud of it. But I was really just kind of following the guy in front of me. Well, you're in a great thing. And you're on static lines. So you're not free falling really per se. Weren't you on static lines or did you? A, a, a 50 pound rock can do it, you know, because yeah. uh, it's a 50 pound test. All you got to do is get out the door and it's going to pull the test and your yeah. chute's going to open yeah. up. It's really, a, it's really, a, it's really more about what you do once you get there as opposed to how you get Oh, yeah. There. I admire people that do it. I more, uh, you know, and people like yourself that did it, even though kind of fell into it, so to speak, you still did it. And, were you, did you ever have to go anywhere? Were you stationed anywhere? I mean, were you, did they move you somewhere else or did you end up going to California? Or what had happened? I was at Fort Bragg it was my home station, my permanent right. party station the whole time. But I, I was deployed several times, uh, you know, away from Fort Bragg, but I always came back to Fort Bragg. Okay. When did you start realizing you wanted to be a musician? Well, Um, I think I was four years old when uh, this gentleman came to the orphanage and in the laundry of the orphanage, they had a big space in the front where the kids could sit if they wanted to. And people would come sometimes and read books to us or uh, usually they'd preach at us and try to try to save our souls. That was mostly what happened. Mm -hmm. But one day this guy named Nile came and he played N-I-L-E-Y. That's how he spelled his name, I believe. And he sang, I'm going to Alabama with a banjo on my knee. Uh, And Rick, you might as well have struck me with a bolt of lightning, buddy. (laughs) I mean, I was a four-year-old kid that could not believe the sounds coming out of that thing that man was holding. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with it. And I knew on that, I knew at that very moment that I was going to play guitar for the rest of my life. So I've always known what I wanted to do. I just didn't know how I was going to do it or if I was going to be any good at it. So mm-hmm. as it turns out, I'm not very good at it, but I do it all the time. And it's how, I, how I've been fortunate enough to make a living all these years. And so I've, I've always known that that was my dream and what I wanted to do. Being really, really poor is a, is a, is a plus in the musician world because the bar you have to set for your sustainability is so low, you know, and I'm fortunate enough that other than the army, I've never really done anything else. When I was in high school, I played in a band with a bunch of gentlemen, my age, they were, you know, all in their fifties or forties. And we played nightclubs and honky tonks. So instead of working at, at a, you know, a, you know, a fast food joint or yeah. something. I, I played in bars yep. on the weekend. And, yeah. and to me at that time, it, that was success. I mean, I was, I, I was making a little bit of money and I was living. And then, you know, then after the army, I moved to California to go to that school. And mm-hmm. those were pretty lean years too. But all those times if, for me, as long as I could continue the craft or the art of trying to learn how to play, then that was a success to me. Uh, It didn't, it wasn't about and has never been about what sort of financial things I may or may not be able to achieve or, Mm -hmm. or even, uh, even what size the crowd is. I mean, to me, I do a lot of VA homes and I do a lot of hospice houses because I don't know if you know about my, my little charity that I have, but Mm -hmm. because of that. So 22 years ago, I started an organization called Tribute to the Troops. And what uh, I have a song called Home that I wrote when I was in the Army about mm-hmm. one of the men in our unit that didn't make it back from one mm-hmm. of our deployments. And, uh, you know, I look back at it now all these years later and realize that not, you know, I write better songs, I hope now. But that song was written from my soul about someone sure. that I loved. Yeah. And it could have been me, you know. So every night when I'd sing, I'd, I would sing this song and ded- dedicate it. And then after 9-11, I was able to. Uh, there were the first, I was living in Minnesota at that time. And there was all these, we took this guy named John Murray 
made a video of that song and it was more like a PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. where he would, the verses would show soldiers doing soldier things, not war things, but just, you know, working on stuff, whatever. Right. And then the choruses showed the members the, of the military from Minnesota who had passed mm -hmm. since nine 11 and it had their name. And I thought, I think their parents would love to see this. Mm -hmm. So the first year it was just me and my friend, Greg Smith, who I started this with. And I think 20 or 25 motorcycles. And we got on our motorcycles and we went to those families' homes. And we gave them this music video and told them, we're going to remember your son, your daughter. We're going to remember his name. Mm. That has since come to, we're a national 501c3 now. We visited over 800 families in the, in the United States. And you're not going to believe this, Rick. But this poor guy from an orphanage in North Carolina and his charity, we have sent 125 children to college whose parents have been killed in the war. Well, that's cool. What a blessing and what a wonderful thing. There's nothing more uh, heartbreaking I could imagine than, than mm -hmm. these people sending their children off and then them mm -hmm. not coming back, you know. But I think even more importantly, the, the fact that we like every every family we've ever visited, we send them a card a handwritten card signed by all of our board of directors and our people every year on the day that their son or daughter lost their life. Mm. And I, I tell people there's two days that you die and that's the day that you actually pass away. And then the day that nobody gives a care anymore, you mm -hmm. know? So we're trying to tell those yeah. families that we do care. And I, and I, I know for a fact, Rick, that it means something to those people. And it has been a, a, a just a, a life changer for some of them and for us as well. We there again, you know, the things that we tried to do to help people, we get so much love and satisfaction out of it that it's, it, it's no way we could ever repay them for what they've done for our no. country. No. And it never goes away. Every day is Memorial day at those houses, man. Yes. It Every is. day. Yeah. You know? So when did you decide to do the documentary and do all this stuff that you got coming out this month, you got I mean, next month, the, the album and all that stuff. How did that all come about? Especially the doing the documentary and all that about your life. Well, for a while I was hosting this show on A and E called operation build. And it's a show where they rebuild veterans who have been injured overseas. They help them uh, make their house. So it's accessible so they can get up and down the steps if they can, or get right. in and out the door. And the people that ran that show, one of the ladies, one of the main producers, her name is J.C. Summerford. She's the one who made the movie, approached me about trying to do a movie about my life. She said, she thought my story was something. And Rick, I, to be honest with you, I thought that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. And I'll, I'll give you the, the cliff notes of it. You know, so I, so so I was found in a garbage dumpster abandoned as an infant. And mm -hmm. I grew up at the Barium Springs Home for Children. But that's not a movie. To me, that's just a bad hand. You know, I got yeah. dealt a bad hand. Yeah. Just bad luck. Lots of people got bad lucks. My my dad had my adopted dad had way worse luck than that. You know, he's missing fingers on his hands because he's working at a sawmill in the sixth Cut grade. I, I didn't I didn't think that. Yeah. So then I got in the army and uh, right after high school and I, you know, was deployed and I started this charity. I still don't think that's a movie. That's just me trying to pay back what I love. And then I moved sure. to California where I went to GIT and then I worked there for a couple of years. I auditioned for probably every rock band you could ever imagine. <laughs> and I didn't get any of them. And I, and I realized after the last one I did, I was doing this last one was, I didn't know it was the last one. I thought it was just the next one, but uh, it got down to, they, in those days, they would have cattle calls and they were looking for a look where thank God that the look doesn't matter anymore. Cause I wouldn't fall into that. Oh, no. Yeah. Day, I know what that, I know what, was it the eighties? Was it the eighties? Yeah. Or? It was the yeah, late eighties, yeah. early nineties. Yeah, so they were and all I looking was, for a look. Yeah. 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 So, and it got down to me and one other fella and we were going to play with the band, not the singer, but the band. And they come in and he was drunk. And I thought, man, I'm going to get this one. <laughs> I'm getting this gig, you know, yeah. and I did pretty good, you know, and quite to be fair, he did pretty good too. You know, he did a nice job and then I didn't get it. And then I realized, well, wait a minute. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I love my wife. They don't want to hang out with me. Yeah. I'm not going to be any fun for them. So I moved yeah. to Nashville. That's still not a movie. I moved to Nashville and I played with people who had record deals and I was lucky enough to write a few songs that people recorded. I'm not very good at it, but I got lucky. That's still not a movie, but then Rick, they found my father. They found my real 
biological father. Who is they? Who is they? Uh, well, my wife hired uh, this company called Twenty Three and Me. Oh, I've heard of that. And uh, yep, and uh, and it came up that they had found my father, and he wow. was still alive. He wow. never knew that I'd been bored. Never knew he had another son. Guess what he did? What? He was a guitar player in a country band. Oh, that's why you got the D thirty. <laughs> he was a paratrooper yeah. in the eighty second Airborne. Wow. And he rode a motorcycle his whole life. Mm. We were exactly alike. Yeah. And that's when I thought, well, maybe it would be a movie that would be cool. Not because I want people to know anything about me, because there's not a whole lot to know, but because it's about perseverance. It doesn't matter whether you want to be a guitar player or a singer or a, a carpenter or a plumber, or you want to open a rickshaw business in, in Shanghai. Yeah. It's about never saying enough. I'm going to keep going. And I'm going to keep going for it. It's a movie about hope. It's what they made. They made a documentary about someone who is just going to go down singing and that's what yeah. I'm going to do, you know? And so yeah. I feel very fortunate that they were to do that. And I, I hope I didn't ruin the movie by telling what happened there, but my mother's story is even more unbelievable than my father's story. So we'll leave that one for them to see the movie. And uh, I'm just very honored that someone would care enough to put that together. And I'm also really, really grateful that when they got done, it didn't suck. You know, because <laughs> it could have, you know, it could have been. I, want, my, I, I bet I said that a hundred times. I said, well, what if this thing sucks when we're done with it? What if it's not very good? And it, and at least, uh, at least by and large, the people that have seen it have said, at least it don't suck. It might be okay. So good. You're bringing this out, but do you have an, uh, an album that goes with it, right? We do. We have a record called Love that kind of accompanies the movie just because we were doing it at the same time. And then a lot of that music ended up on in the movie. I was going to well. say, did you, did they come yeah. to you and say, can you want to add music to it? Or they just had some pockets in there for you to write, put some music in it. Well, it was actually me. I mean, JC's a, a great camera person and my wife did all the research. Well, I can't believe all the research she did and the things she found. And as far as the, the Foley and the editing of the movie, and the background music and all that, that's all me play, playing everything. Like when you sit, there's this walking scene and there's music behind it. That's me doing all that stuff that's in there. So it, it was really kind of a small group of people that made the, that made the whole project. What are you going to do with it? Now that you're I have no with? idea. Well, it's done and we're coming out on Amazon prime on okay. April the 26th. And then on NPR, I guess it's coming out in May. Cool. Uh, on a lot of the NPR stations. And we're just going to, you know, I've always been the kind of person that when I first moved to California, I had a very set goal. I wanted to be Eddie Van Halen, <laughs> except taller and more handsome. That was my plan. <laughs> uh, that didn't work out. So I decided to move to Nashville and be Tim McGraw, okay. except taller and more handsome. That didn't work <laughs> out either. Uh, the young lady, my band says, I'm shooting for Willie Nelson now. But the truth is... <laughs> I'm sitting in this chair, Rick, because I wasn't afraid to walk through whatever door opened. You mm -hmm. know, I just wanted to play. I still want to. My whole goal in life is to learn how to play this thing, try to figure it out, how it goes and see if I can get any good at it. And if, if along the way I can eat every day, I'm, I'm happy with that. So yeah. I'm, 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 on, I'm in for the ride for wherever it goes. So I admire yes. what you get to do because you sit there and get to talk, people come in all the time. I mean, I'm sure there are times you're like, uh, this isn't that good, but I got to do what I got to do. But what do you I think you I look at it like a, like I look at it like this. When a person comes in here, their music is as important to them as Ed Sheeran's music is to him. Absolutely. It doesn't matter. doesn't matter what what level it's at or what sort of proficiency to this person. It's their heart. And if, if I'm going to be. uh pompous enough to take $25 an hour from you or whatever I'm going to take to record you. I'm going to put yeah. my whole heart in it, man. Sure. I'm going to give you everything I got because that's what I would want someone to do to my music. I yeah. want to treat their music the way I hoped or wished mine had always been treated. You know what I mean? Well, and you remember the first time you were in a real studio and heard back your stuff. We all oh, remember yeah. that, that moment. And then you're hearing it back and you're like, I just wrote that. I wrote somebody's doing my stuff. I mean, 
it never gets old. And, and to me, I mean, I, I admire what you did. When did, by the way, when did you start this project? Was it a year or so ago or how long ago was it? Well, we started it back before COVID and was going pretty oh, strong. Wow. And then, and then COVID put a stop to everything. Uh, and then my biological father actually passed away during COVID. I was able to be with him holding his hand when he passed, but not holding his hand, but with him and held his hand till I, I, shortly before. I understand. And, and uh, I just, uh, so it's been years in the process of us making it, you know, we kind of stopped for COVID. And then, uh, so in the movie, you can see that because during COVID, my daughter, who's 20 years old, she was home, still at home with us. And, uh, and we, uh, we watched movies every night and we would share a, a box of hot tamales and Mike and Ike's, which I was trying to eat healthy but i didn't realize how bad they were i gained 30 pounds eating the hot tamales nice. so at the first of the movie i'm skinny and old in the middle of the movie i'm fat and old and now by the end of the movie i'm starting to lose weight again but i'm still old and ugly so it's there it is you know are you are you going to tour again what's your are you thinking about doing we tour that again? all the time I, do. I do lot i do lots of uh, just me and guitar shows i speak at uh colleges and universities and different and then of course my my motorcycle charity i do all those events and then my band we'd probably do 50 50 dates a year full band dates a year of accounts we've had back when i had a record deal and we had a little bit of success we go to all those markets still you know uh mm -hmm. and play wherever we can play there so i my go i'd like to do it full i'd like i'd love to travel even more and play even more with our band if we could when this comes out are you going to kind of go out and do some kind of tour to promote it or we're going to go it? everywhere. They play the movie. We're going to try to go play in that area. Okay. We're going to, we're, we're kind of a self-contained thing. I, I was booked by CAA for years back when I had a record deal. And then after you lose your record deal, they, they, it starts declining and eventually you're still booked by CAA, but they don't get you any work uh, ever. And so, so we've been doing our own for a long time now and we're kind of self-contained. So what we do is we look where there's a little action and see if we can book a venue there. And I always ask people this question, and that is, when did you decide, when was the moment when you were performing or something, you realized, holy crap, I'm actually, look where I am. In other words, when did you know that you'd made it in the music business? Were you playing somewhere? Or had you listed an album? Or you finished them? Where would you, you remember that moment when you kind of go a pinch? As I say, it's the pinch myself moment. I think there were several of them, and and then I think it goes back to the coming from very low, uh, you know, sort of income status. I remember when I got out of the army, and I was I, I finished up my two year associate's music degree before I went to GIT at, at the community college. Right. And I got a job with a band called Dixie and it was, um, and it paid $275 a week. That might as well have been a fortune to me because it was enough that I didn't have to do anything else. Yeah. And I remember thinking, this is it. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. I'm going to play here and I can live. I can make this thing. And then I remember uh, when I first moved to Nashville, uh, I made I made a really good friend with this guy, and I can't remember his name is escaping me now. But he was the bass player for Ronnie Prophet, and Ronnie Prophet was a Canadian singer who had a a hit a gazillion years ago called the uh, the Ghost of the Opry or something like that. I think that's what it was called. Mm -hmm. And he called me and said, "In one hour, Ronnie Prophet's leaving for a." Canadian tour and I can't go because I just got the Martina McBride gig. I just mm -hmm. got it. Can you go play bass for Ronnie Prophet? And that was the first time I was ever going to get on a bus, right? And I didn't play bass at all. <laughs> I didn't, I, mean, I didn't, but I said I did. That's, a, that's another thing that I do. I, sh I should, I should be very honest with you, Rick. When people call me and say, can you score the movie? I go, oh yeah, I can do oh, that. Yeah. Even if I don't have a clue what I'm doing, I'm gonna I'll do say it. I can do it and I'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah. So I went to a pawn shop and I bought a cheap Squire bass that stayed in tune, and I had a cassette, and I was writing charts all the way from Nashville to Calgary, Alberta, Canada on that bus. But on that bus, I had a bunk, and I was thinking, man, this is it. This is the big time, you know? Yeah. And then I played all the way across Canada with Ronnie Prophet, 
And then we were heading back to Nashville and he was having everybody come up to the front. It was two weeks, two and a half weeks, I think. And he was writing their check, you know, for them playing. And I remember he wrote the check and he said, I want you to know that you're one of the nicest people I've ever had on this bus, but you're not a bass player. <laughs> <laughs> he told you at the end of the tour. <laughs> at the end of the tour. Because, I mean, I might have known. It's one of those things where I might have known what the chord was, but that don't mean I was doing what a bass player does, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then I think when I lived in Minnesota and I got to the point that we were selling small clubs, right before I got a record deal, the year before I got a record deal, I did 320 one-nighters. Wow. Uh, but at that time, there was no crew. There was no bus. It was me. I had a 15-passenger a van that the four of us traveled in and an eight by 20 trailer. And I set it all up myself. I would set it all up. We'd play, tear it down, do it again tomorrow night. That felt like success to me because mm -hmm. I was doing my music and I was charging a ticket that people would pay. It was a couple of bucks or whatever. And then when I got a record deal, I don't think that hit me. I didn't. So I guess at this point, I don't know if I ever felt like I made it, but I've been able to make it through I got to it. the next step. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. That makes that. It, it, I tell people, younger people all the time, if I'm busy with them, it's like, you don't need to be a star to make money. No. No, you can play anywhere and still have a good life. And you can walk down the street. And nobody knows who you are. You might say, well, I play with, you know, whatever, whoever I would play with. And they're not going to know you're, you're a hard gun to stand in the back. They're getting all the big money. You're standing back, to, but you still have that success. There was a several artists in Nashville who were kind of big that would have a rotating group of musicians because maybe they weren't the easiest people to work with or something. Mm -hmm. And and I was one of those guys that kind of got every one of those gigs that was the interim gig. You know what I mean? Right. Vern yeah. Gosden's famous for that. Vern Gosden used to have this rule where the bus had to leave exactly at this time and you had to be on it or you would be fired and he traveled with two Tascam d88s do you remember those the mm -hmm. digital 24 track then and he had every single part on the Tascam. and so we had to play with a click which i hate by the way i, but, I mean not in, the, in a studio i don't mind it but in live i just think it just sucks all the life out of yeah. it but anyway that's a whole other story and i remember pat what was his name pat Pat something was playing bass and the bus was leaving the Shoney's parking lot at midnight. Cause it always left at midnight. Everybody left from Shoney's down to the green at midnight <laughs> and, and Pat wasn't there. And so the bus just left at 12 and apparently Pat got there like at 1203 or something. And we were playing in Augusta, Georgia at some, you know, honky tonk, some kind of thing, but it was nice cause he was an artist and we got all the way down there and Pat was waiting at the door. Uh, for waiting at the door to get in and the road manager got off and said, what are you doing? And he says, well, I just got here. I'm sorry I'm late. I'll never, ever be late again. And he said, well, what if we'd played in San Diego? You couldn't drive to San Diego. And he didn't let him play and he still had him fired. Mm. You know, and I thought, gosh, I, I didn't say it was heartless, but it was also, it was tough on Pat, you know, oh, it yeah. was a tough, tough rig. So I had a whole bunch of those kind of gigs and I played a bunch of, I've done, you know, a, a gazillion publishing demos for sony and rca and those kind of things lots of studio stuff and then then i i had the distinct pleasure this is a texas story i should tell you the story i had the distinct pleasure of playing with this uh artist on bna records i won't tell you his name but he was this the first artist out on bna records anybody that wanted to do the the artist and you know um uh, and we were and he had a hit he had he had two top 10 records and it wasn't going very well after that because he had a substance abuse problem. Mm. And so I was playing this tour and I was the band leader. I'd put the band together and we were playing at the East Texas Saloon in Galveston, which mm -hmm. is across the road from Gillies. Yep. And he sold a grand total of nine tickets. <laughs> there were nine people in there. <laughs> and typically... I would do a couple songs with the band. I would sing a couple songs with the band and warm up or whatever. Mostly it was to make sure the PA was working and everything was good. And then we'd start the vamp and he would come up and do his show. Oh, okay. And I had strung all of the songs together so that uh, so that once he got up there, he could get through it. Even if he was 
hammered or whatever. So you, Once you, he got had going, set, you had the set list all done. You did that. Yeah, it was right. and, and and the songs were the and the music was all kind of kind of Kenny Rogers. If you ever saw Kenny Rogers, how the songs flowed in and out of each okay, other. Yeah, I was trying to trying to steal that idea. Right. Anyway, so we did two songs. He's not anywhere to be seen. We do four songs. It's thirty <laughs> minutes later, and nobody's there. And then and then and they're like, get you know, get me off the stage. Where's the guy we paid? Yeah, whatever. That's right. You know. That's right. And so then his 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 brother was his road manager. And his brother came out and got into an argument with the bar owner, and they got into a fist of cuffs uh -oh. down there. And so the bouncers kicked them and a couple people out. So our nine people are down to like five people at this point. And then finally he shows up. He's at the edge of the stage. His eyes are about this big, <laughs> and he's ready to come on. So I said, okay, hit the vamp. So we stopped my song in mid-song, and we started playing the vamp. And I said, you've seen him on CMT or whatever. The, whatever whatever, whatever it was, it was at the time, yeah. yeah. And then he comes up. And he stands in front of the microphone and he throws up <laughs> all, over, all over the monitor, all over the floor. And then he kind of just wobbles around and he falls over. And he's, he's not passed out. He's just kind of laying there, right? <laughs> laying there in the puke. And I thought, hey, you know, I'll start singing the song, right? I'll start singing it. And, uh, and then he'll just get up and sing. And I, I, let's see if I, I don't know if I remember it. See, well, I'm a lover, not a fighter, and you've been picking on me all day. So I started to sing into that song, and and I think he'll just get up, right? Well, he lays there for the entire song, doesn't say a word, and I sing the whole song. Well, the way the set's designed, as soon as we finish that song, we go into the next song. Right, yeah, yeah, and yeah. By the, and then that's when the fight happened, actually. That happened when he wouldn't get up and sing. So anyway, he lays there as we do an entire 45 minute set by the halfway through the set. He's cursing at me and telling said every word in the world. Right. When we yeah. finish, we, we finish our thing. He never did get up ever. <laughs> uh, and and I and I and I and I put it down. And I tell Michael, the bass player, I say, Mike, just do my gear. I'm going to take care of the, the young man. And so. I help him up and I'm walking him to the bus and he's saying, I know I used to be a golden gloves boxer. I'll kick your whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 And so we get almost to the bus and I stop and I look at him and I say, listen, there's only two people in Galveston, Texas that care if you get on this bus alive tonight. And one of them's losing interest really fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And so I put him on the bus and, uh, and that's when I had the epiphany that, Hey, I could do this. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had the fortune to me. That was a blessing. It was fortunate that I got to play with three or four really dysfunctional artists right in a row. And I thought, well, I can do this. I might not be as good as that person or whatever, but I'm not going to go out there and throw up and lay on the floor. I'm at no. least going to give it my best shot. Right. Yeah. And so maybe that was the moment I felt like I'd made it when I finally yeah. said, come, come hell or high water, I'm going to do it at whatever capacity I'm able to do it. I had a I had a record deal and we were on tour opening for Carrie Underwood and the entire part of Nashville music and the whole country just kind of fell apart in 2007 or whatever year it was mm -hmm. where the economy went paces my record label closed and I went from having a tour bus and a band and a and a and a tour we were on to nothing. Like it was all just kind of pulled away. Now we don't address that in the movie because I don't want to be a spilled sour grapes kind of person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my wife looked at me and she said, "Let's build something that nobody can take away from mm -hmm. us." And so I'm not selling millions of records, but out in the world, in this whole great big world, there's thirty-five or forty thousand people that'll buy everything I ever do. Nothing wrong with and that. You do the math and it's a living. Yeah. And so it's my responsibility to give them the best of everything I have every single day because it's security. And the one thing I've never, ever had in my whole life, and you know this from, well, you, well, you were a corporate guy, but as if you live in a van and you're trying to make it from, <laughs> you know, from Gillette, Wyoming to Bozeman to play that honky tonk and that honky tonk, you don't have security. 
Mm-mm. You're hoping the oil pump makes it. You're hoping the tires are good enough. And maybe after after another week, you can get some tires. For the first time in my life, I have security. And it came from people that didn't even know me. And when I had all the record label and the managers and the booking agents, there was no security in that because it could be taken away just like yeah. this. Yeah. And what we have now, not only is it can't be taken away, it really means something. Those 125 children we sent to college, mm. those hundreds of families that we visited, you know, one of I just had a guy had a hit. One of the questions he asked was, "Science says that 13 to 15 is when chill, when you feel the most uh, the most emotional experience to music, and how does that relate to you?" And I said, "I I, I appreciate that science might said that, but that person." never stood next to a gold star mother at Arlington cemetery when they brought their son's casket Mm. to bury in the field and bagpipes was playing Mm. amazing grace because a 13 year old couldn't possibly feel that deeply Mm -hmm. what that mother's feeling. You know what I mean? Yeah. And this thing that we built, it's ours and it's, and it's close to our heart, but it's also something that is uniquely ours and belongs only to us and to all of our fans and friends. Mm. 